three, two, one. Good morning. I know we sang that song, Roaring Like a Lion, uh, but you were not. I, I didn't even sing it. I was not roaring like a lion today. Good grief. Maybe a cat, you know, but not a lion. I'm tired. i got a long day. I'm teaching 101 class after all this stuff, so it's, whew. And I don't even like caffeine, but I'm going to try it today. So. We are beginning a new message series called YOLO. Uh, you may not be familiar with that slang term. It stands for you only live once. And uh, I found a few of these uh, little yellow statements they make on the internet, on Twitter. And uh, here's, what, here's what people wrote. I just made my own parking spot at school. You only live once. Going to take a course in Buddhism over the holidays. YOLO. I only live once. Went to a shoe shop. They didn't have size 9, but they did have size 11. Asked if I would like to try them, so I did. I'd never tried size 11. You only live once. So my dad has this new rule that I can't be on my phone past 10 o'clock. It's 10.01. You only live once. It's this generation's uh, carpe diem statement. Seize the day. You only live once. My generation, it was this. You only go around once in life, so you go for the gusto. Remember that beer commercial? I, love, I started, I, I watched, I don't know how many uh, uh, commercials that, a couple of weeks ago uh, on uh, Schlitz. It was Schlitz. And, and if you're out of Schlitz, you're out of beer. Right, thank you uh, for paying attention to the 70s. <laughs> you go for all the gusto you can. For the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at some people who, who died, but they came back to life. You only lived once is not true. That is not true at all. There are several instances in the Bible, in fact, we read that, that people died and literally came back to life. They were given a second chance in life. In fact, the Bible teaches us uh, that, that eternity has been placed in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. This life on earth will end. It's short. At best, we probably have 100 years. One day our heart's going to stop, and my time on earth is over. But that's not the end of me. There are probably times when things get a little quiet in the house in which we just sit and think about it, begin to wonder if there's more to life than this life. Maybe when we attend a funeral... And we just stare at the casket and think there's got to be, please, there's got to be, there's got to be more than this. If this is it, this is it, then, then you only live once, right? Then you do whatever you want because you only live once. But there seems to be something in our heart that tells us, no, there's not. There's more to life than this life. Only a fool would go unprepared for something that's going to happen. We need to think more about eternal things than, instead of less about it. We don't like to think about eternity. We need to spend more time thinking about the eternal things. So let's go ahead. We only live once. Mark chapter 5, 21 through 23. Jesus got into the boat again, went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then the leader of the local synagogue, whose name is Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, my daughter, my little daughter's died. Please come and lay your hands on her, heal her so she can live. Now, right before this, is that Jesus got back into the boat, went to the other side. Uh, right before this happens, Jesus does a miracle and he heals a guy who had been possessed with demons. And we might know this story about Jesus uh, cast the demons out of, this, uh, out of this guy and they go into these pigs and the, there's 2,000 pigs and these pigs run uh, over a cliff and die. And it is an incredible uh, thing. Um, the, the, this demon-possessed man sees Jesus and says, Jesus, why, why are you bothering me? Interesting question, isn't it? Why are you bothering me, Jesus? 
truth is, Jesus bothers us a lot, doesn't he? Especially if we're doing stuff, right, that are out, outside of things. And, and Jesus bothers us all the time. Why are you messing with my life, Jesus? Why are you bothering me? Jesus commands the spirit to leave, and the spirits obey Jesus, and uh, an entire herd of pigs dies. 2,000, think about that, 2,000 pigs. That's an enormous amount of income lost. That's an enormous amount of hit on the local economy. The people who are watching the pigs run into the town and tell the town folks about, the, about what happened to the pigs, and these town folks come out, and they are in a panic. They are not happy. They see dead pigs everywhere, and they see this man who had, uh, this man who had created havoc all over their town. This man who had been possessed with demons, who had, had, had messed up everybody's lives, they see this man is calm, but their pigs are dead. So they tell Jesus to leave. They kick Jesus out of the town. You would think that this would be a good thing, that people would be like super happy that this demon-possessed man was okay and he was no longer going to harass people. He was not going to scare people. He was not going to bother people. He was not going right, to affect anybody else's life. Everything's fine with this guy. But these guys, they're not happy that Jesus has taken this man's life and healed him but ruined their economy. He had brought peace to the region. But they plead with him to leave. You need to go away. I don't want you here. I don't want you in our town. I don't want you in our lives. You messed up our way of life. Think about that. Think about it. this is Jesus just heals this guy. And they kick Jesus out of the town. They didn't kick the demon-possessed guy out of the town. They kicked Jesus out of the town. So Jesus leaves. He had made them so uncomfortable that he leaves. Think about that. If, if, Jesus will make us uncomfortable. And if we are uncomfortable with Jesus, it's pretty easy for us to say to Jesus, you need to leave and Jesus will. That should scare most of us. If you want Jesus out of your life, he's fine. He, he's not going to push. He'll make you uncomfortable. That's for sure. So Jesus has across the lake and he's greeted by a large group of people. A leader from the synagogue who is there pleads with Jesus to heal uh, his, uh, J Jairus wants Jesus to heal his daughter. His young daughter's dying. Everybody knows it. They've tried all kinds of things. This man is probably uh, probably the most wealthy, the wealthiest guy in town. So he probably has tried every kind of healthcare um, solution known to them he spared no expense, and you would too. I mean, if you had the money and your daughter is sick and dying, you're going to take whatever means you have to do to get her well. Nothing matters to this guy more than his daughter. Remember how the folks in the other town wanted Jesus out? You're scaring us. You cost us money. You need to leave. I know you healed a guy. But you need to leave. But when it's in your when it's your own daughter, you are grabbing hold of Jesus and say, "You need to come with me now. You need to come with nothing else matters." So Jesus goes with them. Jesus starts walking with him, and Jesus is interrupted by something that happens. A woman touches Jesus, and that touch. Uh, uh, well, she didn't even touch Jesus. The Bible says she just got a little bit of the, the kind of the fringe of Jesus' robe. It was no big deal, but she just reached out for him, touched a little bit of his robe, and she is healed. Jesus realizes that something happens, which is super weird. And again, here's Jesus. I mean, he's with Jairus. There's people all over the place. They're following him. Everybody's kind of, and, and Jesus stops and says, wait a minute. Something just happened here. Power has left me. I felt it. And the disciples are like, what are you talking about? Jesus, everybody's. Are you sure? He says, yeah, I felt it. And kind of people backed up, and Jesus says, hey, who touched me? And, and, and uh, uh, Jesus looking around all the while. I think Jairus is getting nervous. I think Jairus is getting a little concerned here. Why are we stopping? This is urgent. We need to go. Let's not stop. Why are we taking time out of this? this is, let's, let, no, Jesus, focus. Let's go. And, and Jesus stops, and so we get in and. 
and I can, I can understand this man's anxiety. My kid's dying. This, this is like, we're calling the ambulance. We're not walking to the hospital. We're, we need help now. A frightened woman comes forward and confesses that she was the one that touched Jesus. So I'm so sorry, but I knew if I could just touch you, I would be okay. And she falls on her feet and surrender. And Jesus says these incredible words, Daughter, your, your faith has made you well. Amazing moment. And, and this is a great moment, right? This is an incredible moment. This woman has been healed. She had been sick for 12 years. It was a, uh, an illness that, again, nobody could help her with. And she just, it's, she's well. Everybody's happy about it, except Jairus is a little nervous. And then there's some commotion here. And check this out, Mark 5, 35. While he was still speaking to her, the woman that just got healed, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter's dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. I'm sure he just crumbled to the ground. Devastated. Hope was standing right in front of him. And there is no need to bother Jesus now. Doesn't matter. Mark 5, 36. Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Don't be afraid, just have faith. That's it? That's it? We are afraid a lot. A lot of things that phrase, uh, fear, we... Uh, make us afraid. Fear ruins so many things and dominates our lives and our decisions. Recently, I, a friend of mine who's a pastor asked on Facebook for the people who follow him on Facebook to share with, them, uh, with him. He was uh, doing a, a little research for a message and he said, I, I want you to tell me what you are afraid of. I was shocked at the hundreds of responses that people shared with. I mean, it was an enormous amount of response. It appears to me that we're afraid of so many things. Here's some things that people listed on his Facebook post. I'm afraid of making mistakes. I'm afraid of losing the love of my life. I'm afraid of being alone. I'm afraid of losing another child. I'm afraid that my children will, ch will not choose to follow Jesus. I'm, af I'm afraid of failure, plain and simple. I'm afraid of getting a horrible disease like Alzheimer's. So these words that Jesus shares to Jairus, you just don't be afraid, just trust me, are enormous words for us. And the question we ask and still is, would, would, is can we trust Jesus with this? So they make their way to Jairus' home, and it is a sad place. The people are devastated, inconsolable. Hearts are breaking. And Jesus steps into the scene. Mark 5, 39. Jesus, he went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? <laughs> and that just seems like a ridiculous, right? That's just ridiculous. Why are you crying? Well, Jesus, somebody died. Are you kidding me? I mean, you talk about the insensitivity right now of Jesus. Why are you, what's your problem? Why are you guys crying? I don't know, um, she died. I mean, you just want to punch him. You're like, what do you think you're doing? You're making it worse. You're not making this better. You, you, you took your time. You didn't get here when you could have. She's dead. And I think it's your fault. Now you say, why are you crying? So he says, the child isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. He made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Folks start laughing at Jesus. What a joke. He thinks she's sleeping. You're out of your mind. And this is not funny, Jesus. Think about this. No one knows more about life and death than Jesus. No one understands death more than Jesus. And they're laughing at Jesus. The creator of life and the eventual conqueror of death himself is laughed at by people. 
Are you out of your ever loving mind, Jesus? Are you smoking funny stuff? Have you, are you going insane? What in the world do you think? What? You think she's asleep? Now, how many of us laugh at Jesus? Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're kidding me, really? You want me to do what with my money? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't know what you're talking about sec- with sexuality, Jesus? <laughs> you, don't, you don't know nothing about it. You don't know what you're talking about when it comes to relationships. You don't know. You don't know. You're a joke, Jesus. Jesus walks into this little girl's room. Mark 5, 41 records, holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the little girl who was 12 immediately stood up and walked around, overwhelmed, amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. The little girl, get up. You imagine at this moment the, the, the angels in heaven leaning forward a little bit at this moment. They had, wa- wa- they had watched the girl die and the prayers and the tears and the concerns of the family. And, and now Jesus is there and, they, and he says, Take, get up. And they lean in and watch a resurrection take place. She was dead, now is alive. Her parents can't believe it. No one can. They're overwhelmed with amazement and wonder and happiness and joy. They can hardly stand it. And yet Jesus says, don't tell me. What? What? We're not supposed to tell anybody? I don't know. What do you do when fear comes your way? when you can't breathe, when you don't know what to do, when you've tried everything possible, everything that you could think of, everything that your friends could think of, but yet nothing's working and nothing's satisfying, and it just seems as if there is no hope and there's no way out and there's no use going on. Let's not even going to bother Jesus with this anymore. Jairus is surrounded by people who do not like Jesus. I mean, think about it. Again, Jairus, think about it. He is surrounded by people who don't like Jesus. He's the leader of the synagogue. Those people didn't like Jesus. The religious folks didn't like Jesus. So Jairus' family, Jairus' church, Jairus' town, the neighboring town, don't even like Jesus. But when your daughter's sick, you'll turn to Jesus, right? How many of us did that when we had the, a, a problem so big that only Jesus could solve it? We finally turned to him. Matthew 5, 11. Or Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, he says, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. When Jairus, Jairus asked Jesus to go with him, Jesus was not in a hurry. But Jairus went with him. I'm sure Jairus is like, let's come on, come on, come on, right? And then the girl t- touches Jesus, and Jairus is like, come on. But Jesus is not in a hurry. Even, so Jairus still goes with him. I'm sure that Jairus was nervous, but Jairus still goes with Jesus. Even when the, new, the bad news came, Jairus still went with Jesus back home. Jairus Everyone, everybody, went, everybody was laughing at Jesus. Jairus still trusted Jesus. Through that whole story, Jairus trusts Jesus. I don't know about you, I probably would have given up. I probably would have, when the, when the folks came in and said, it's too late, don't bother the teacher anymore, I said, Jesus, thanks you. I'm glad, you, I'm, thank you for, 
but I don't, I don't need you now. I'm sure you got better things to do. I'm sure they're more important stuff, but this is, it's too late. It's just too late. We look at the we look at the we look at the situation and we think it's impossible. Jesus can't even fix this one. In fact, it looks as if Jesus doesn't even care. I don't think Jesus even cares. But God does His best when we begin to realize we are completely helpless to pull this off. Mark ten twenty seven says Jesus looked at them intently, humanly speaking. It is impossible. But not with God. Everything is possible with God. We don't, we don't really know much about this little girl. We don't know what happened with her life. We don't know what she became. We don't know if she grew up and became right a leader or a, a teacher or maybe a physician or maybe decided to give her life to, to you know social work or you know or what you know became we don't know what she did with her life. We'd like to think that, you know, maybe she made something of herself. Once she was given a second chance in life, she said, I'm not going to waste my life. I'm not going to just, I, I'm, I don't just live once. Right? We'd like to think that, but we don't know. We would like to fill in the blanks. We don't know if she had kids. We don't know if she told anybody the story. You know, we don't know if she brought her friends to church with her. It's like, you got to go to church with me now. But we do know that her life, this moment in life is a testimony. She was dead, now is alive. No one argues with a, right, with a person who came back to life. <laughs> She's like, well, why do you believe me? I oh, see, I died and I'm back to life. I mean, you can't, no, you weren't. Yeah, I, I was dead, I'm alive. Which, by the way, is our story. Changed life. No one, argue, no one can argue. Once I was here, now I'm here, right? It's my story. I was once dead, now I was alive again. Ephesians 2 says, God who is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. And he raised Christ from the dead. It was only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. Romans 6. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried by Christ by baptism and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live what? The same old life? Don't go back to the same old life once we've been given a new one. Why would we go back to the old life? We may live new lives. Or have you forgotten? Yep, we probably have. I don't know why we forget that Jesus raised us from the dead. You would think we would remember. You would think that that would be a constant, right? You would, that, think about it. Here's this, this girl, I don't think she forgot that she died. I don't think her parents ever forgot that she died. I don't think that uh, her cousins ever forgot that she, I, I don't think her, her playmates, right? Everybody knew she died. That's, I don't think she ever forgot that. And the stories that she would tell then of a man taking her hand and bringing her back to life. But we forget. We forget that we died to our old way of life, our old thinking, old way of handling relationships, old way of dealing with money, old way of, of, of and the sexuality, old way of, of uh, handling anger. We died to that. We forget. So the big question we have to ask is, and there's two of them, will I trust Jesus and will I walk with him? Can I trust him and will I walk with him? Jairus had to come to the conclusion, I'm going to trust Jesus 
with my biggest problem. I will trust him with my most important thing in my life. And I will walk with him where, if he says we need to go now, I, I, if he, I, I, will, I will walk with him. So that's the question we have to ask. Is Jesus trustworthy? And will I walk with him? Those are questions you have to answer. And if so, if you say, I can trust him and I will walk with him, then maybe Romans 6 is for you today. Have you, that you, you've never been buried with Christ by baptism. You have never taken that step of faith and said, you know what, I'm gonna die to my old life. The patterns, the thoughts, the uh, uh, decisions that I've made, I'm gonna die to that, I'm gonna bury that. And I would like to raise up to a new life and then trust him and walk with him. Now, maybe some of you are thinking about that and you want to do that. Let me throw this out there. You know, Easter's coming up and I think Easter's a perfect day to be baptized. I think that's a great day because there's lots of death and burial and resurrection stuff going on. Everybody thinks about it, right? And so we were kind of saying, well, let's just have a day of decision. We're going to make Easter our day of decision. And, and um Easter is so big this year, we're not just limiting it to one day. We're going to have two days. So uh, we're going to have Saturday and Sunday, two services on Saturday, 4.30 and 6 o'clock, and then three on Sunday, 8, 9.30 and 11. And we'd like to encourage you to think about being baptized on that day. I think one of the, one of the cool reasons why is that because Easter helps me not forget. Because like every year, oh yeah, yeah, that was the year, oh yeah. We've already had people who have indicated they want to be baptized on Easter, and if that's something that you would like to do, uh, just let us know. We will arrange for that. Now, you don't have to wait for Easter. If you want to be baptized today, because today is the day of salvation for you. We have baptisms at 11 o'clock if you want to join them, and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to come home. I'm like, all right. Or if you want to be baptized now. And following the service, we'll, we'll do that. You just come and talk with me, and we'll take care of it. All right? Will you trust him? And are you going to walk with him? Let's pray. There is no doubt that we have been living our life as if we only live once. We'll try all kinds of ways to make adventure possible, whether it's business deals or relationship encounters or high-stake um, adventures where we want to feel alive. And even after jumping out of a plane or riding really fast in a car or on a motorcycle or after a pretty strong night of partying. We have got to, in the quietness of those moments, we've got to think to ourselves, is this it? Because you have placed eternity into our hearts, Lord, we know that there is more to life than just going for all the gusto. So we want to come alive. That our lives on earth will matter and that there's something more to just the way we've been living life. I'm praying today that there might be somebody here who will trust you and walk with you die to their old life and raise to new. In Christ's name, amen. It was a, a very surreal couple of months finding that whole thing out. We were just living life, going along like normal, getting up in the morning, getting dressed, going to work, playing in the band, serving on worship team, and I had been experiencing some abdominal pains, very minor, and really didn't think much of it. 
it just really didn't seem like it was anything all that serious. That was until last summer, and I completely lost my appetite, started losing weight really fast, uh, which was quite unusual for me, as I'm more used to putting on weight and eating really big. That led us to go see a gastroenterologist, and he immediately ordered a CAT scan, and then he ordered a biopsy, and then he set up an appointment with an oncologist, and when we got the initial results back, it was pretty clear that my abdomen was pretty full of uh, malignant cancer cells. Uh, focused on my omentum and my appendix and my colon. When we did finally see the oncologist, he was probably the first one that used the word incurable, which led both my wife and myself to kind of shut down a little bit, I think and because um, it was you know pretty shocking news and and uh, we don't really I don't think either one of us really remember too much of the rest of that conversation um, until we got back in the car we we're getting ready to leave the hospital and we just decided we prayed and we decided to take ownership of this thing and and we were gonna beat it through the power of prayer and positivity we immediately reached out to uh, friends and family um, everywhere that we could and ask them to start praying. And it didn't really matter whether they were Christians or not. The power of prayer has done some very positive things in my life and in the lives of, of uh, my loved ones. Putting our faith in God to get us through this was really never in question. We have an army of prayer warriors uh, that are supporting us from uh, San Francisco to Tulsa to Minneapolis to Seattle and and of course here in the Omaha community as well. I am so very grateful for that support and for the smile it puts on my face and the joy in my heart. I choose faith, be, faith because I am just absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt convinced that God has the power to heal me. And I, I mean I just I just think of that as fact. Um, I know that he still has some things that he wants me to get accomplished for his kingdom while I'm still here on earth. Things have changed a little bit. Um, I have three more chemotherapy sessions remaining uh, out of 12. And once I finish the chemotherapy, uh, the doctors will uh, decide whether or not I need surgery. The prognosis is actually very, very good they could come back and say, you know, hey, Mr. Glick, we uh, just cannot find any more cancer in you, and so you don't need surgery. Uh, my oncologist says that's very unlikely that that will happen, but in my mind, that means there is a chance. It probably comes out as sounding a little bit cliche, but um, I know I'm never gonna be the same guy again. Um, I just have this sense of urgency uh, to really start uh, tackling some of the things that God's been talking to me about. I feel this sense of urgency to uh, build and rebuild the relationships that have uh, faded over time. Um, I just really feel like I, I can and will do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My name is Rich and I am very thankful that every day is a chance to live a new life.